Hello and welcome back to Lorefat Gaming Play Spars Gate 3. I'm your host, Lorefat, and Spars Gate 3 build video. We're doing the Purifier Eldritch Knight, the Protector build. As always, like, comment, and subscribe to my channel for more Bards Gate 3 builds like this. Do not forget to hit notification bell so be updated and much more. Here are the pros and cons of this build. Let's get the cons out of the way. Anything like magical, like for example, fireball or natural, uh, I should say, type attack like acid, cold, or something like that, you might suffer a bit. Uh, number two, I'll probably say you're not going to do much damage like you did as if you're a two-hand weapon fighter. Now, here's the, uh, I should say, definitely pros of this build video. You're going to have very high AC, extremely high. You can have a lot of number of attacks as well since this is a pure fighter. Another huge advantage I uh, do like is the hit points. You're going to have a lot of hit points. And number four, that shield is really useful. So I'm going to go ahead and, of course, begin this build video with the character creation. Now, please note one thing. I'm using Lizel as demonstration from level 2 to 12. It's time to go ahead and go all over all the races in the game. Now, uh, please know about one thing. Um, go ahead and go over the possible races, including the Gith Yankee. And, yeah, Lizel, like I said before, will be the demonstration from level 2 to 12. She's a nice alternative for this build as well. First of all, Tieflings. We're going to go a little bit different on that in a few moments. Base racial speed is 9 meters, which is good. They have dark vision, see in the dark. Very useful. This is a good one as well for tanking. Have resistance to fire, only take half fire damage. I pick Amodius Tieflings because they have some nice spells. Eventually down the line, they have darkness. This one's good though because you could use a, use a flame just to throw at certain places to light it up or hit foes with it. Now uh, next up is the humans. This is actually a very good race for this build. Base racial speed, nice. Now civil militia, again shields the key for this build. It has that there, which I do love. And plus I have ability to have another uh, skill. Since they're humans, instead of your normal four toll, they get five. So let's go ahead and do a demonstration. I'm gonna go do sage. So let me uh, get rid of this first of all and just do a little bit of that. So anyways, instead of your uh, five, your two locked in, I mean four, your two locked in, you'll uh, get one extra to pick. So for example, you want, uh, for instance, I should say acrobats, uh, athletics, survival and intimidation, and you go ahead and pick something like perception or persuasion or anything else of the matter. It's a very good race though for the skills definitely. Gith Yankee, this is a nice surprise one besides items throughout the game that are Gith Yankee related. They also have Astral no uh, Knowledge, which gains proficiency in all skills of a chosen ability. Now, they have uh, Mage Hands, which means if something far away to reach, like a corpse or something, you go ahead and use it to grab. Their base racial speed is 9 meters, which is good, just like the humans and tieflings, which I love. Uh, Martial Prodigy, and uh, key, uh, the one weapon is a long sword, which is a one-handed weapon, which is very good as well. So, the Dwarfs, this is actually a good race for this build, possibly one of the best. Their uh, base uh, movement speed is 7.5, that's alright. They have proficiency in battle axes, hand axes, light armor, and such. They have dark vision, which sees 12 meters, good. And also very good resistant to poison. And trust me, beginning, beginning game, there are some folks that can poison. Dwarven Toughness, your hit point max increases by 1, and increases 1 for every level, so that's 12 extra hit points. You're a tank, you're going to need that. <laughs> Next up, I believe last not least is the half orc. Now the half orc are good for damage. To boost up their damage, their base uh, racial speed is nine meters, which is good. They can also see in the dark, folks. Very good. Now this is another tanking ability. Also, I believe after dark vision, uh, when you get zero hit points, you gain one hit point. It's probably on a time or two when you're down. It's very good. Savage attack. So when you do a critical hit, you get another dice roll. So you do more damage as a tank. So, for this build, I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate with the Gith Yankee. Now, what this build is all about is you're basically a tank. You heard me right, a tank. You can either go defense and protection. I prefer protection much better because when you have a shield, it imposes disadvantages on attacking against your allies when you are within 1.5 meters of your foes. And you must uh, be able to see the attacker too. Very good style to start with. Now, uh, next up I decided to pick for background is the soldier. It's the best way to actually go for this build. Now, let's go ahead and do the ability scores. First of all, we're going to put two points in the strength right there. That's our base one, and then one in the constitution. That's our secondary stat. We're going to put this at 16. We're going to work that on the way to 20, and then there's other ways to boost that to 24 as well. 
Dexterity, I put 14. We'll get some AC really up there since we're a tank. Some builds will actually put that Dexterity to 16 and more. Constitution, I put to 16 for more hit points since we're out there tanking like crazy. We might as well boost up those hit points. Intelligence, I put to 10 because of the fact we're Eldritch Knight and we're going to use some Arcane Magic. Wisdom, I did to 10 also because there's some story checks you uh, definitely want. Charisma, unfortunately, is at 8, so you're going to have to have someone else to talk for you. Now, uh, next on the list, everyone, are these skills. So let's go over that. I felt like since I did Soldier, so I get Athletics and, of course, Intimidation. Pick Acrobats because you'll move around a lot in this battlefield and Survival just to check things out. So that's the best way I go for these skills. Now, uh, let's go ahead and level up our, you guessed it right, the Protector. Since we have Lizelle here, I gave her some armor, I gave herself a nice shield, and a, a very good one-handed weapon. So let's uh, go ahead and get Lizelle up there, really, at this uh, time. So when we get to a level 2, as with all fighters, we get Action Surge. So let me go ahead and explain about Action Surge. Action Surge does is it gives you an extra uh, bonus action to use. Like, for example, you get an extra attack, and later on you get an extra two attacks, the extra action. Which is very good to abuse. Short rest or long rest, I believe. Now we're going to go ahead and do level 3. You're going to start a little slow, but once you get to 4 and 5, you're going to pick it up. Our specialization, we're going to go ahead and switch. Uh, besides our race, we get to get the Yankee Psionic Jump. We jump much for father. Check other races for that. We did Eldritch Knight, so that's our subclass. Our level 0 spells, I call it. I'm going to go ahead and do Fire Bolt. That's just used to turn on lights. And also uh, quickly damage enemies. It's like a nice uh, pull spell. This one I like is the best. Blade Ward. So you only take half damage in blunt, piercing, and slashing. So cast this before fighting. And then go into uh, combat with this advantage for two turns. Now next up I decide to do Chromatic Orb. This is another pull spell. I like to use that and abuse it as uh, well. And yet you get to also do other types of damage with it too. Now, I did shield because this is a reaction spell, so when we pop this, it would increase our armor class by 5. And that's really useful. Also, you take no damage from magic and miss missile, which is extremely useful, everyone. Expand it, I did for story reasons, is find familiar because there's, there's places out there where there's little holes you could use your familiar to open the doors for you and do other things as well. That's why I definitely pick it. Yeah, you get to abuse that like crazy. So let's get to level 4. Now, every uh, levels for fighters 4, 6, 8, and 12, you get feats. This build, you're going to benefit in all of them. For spells, we get another spell. I decide to uh, go ahead and go for Thunder Wave so we can push foes back in case there's way too many of them by someone else. So it's a good thing I uh, picked that one. We could replace spells at any time until uh, level 12. After you level to 12, you can't do that anymore. Now for feats, I decide to go uh, this path. There's two paths. One's a Shield Master, the other one's a Sentinel. Shield Master is the best one. Dexterity saving throw bonus plus two. You gain plus uh, two bonus dexterity saving throws while wielding a shield. That's very good. So we have good dexterity. We'll benefit from that. Master, uh, shield Master block. If a spell forces you to make a dexterity saving throw, you can use your reaction to shield yourself. Fail, you only take half. When you succeed, no damage. It's like raise your shield like a Spartan. So let's go ahead and get to level 5. We're going to get something that I do love as a fighter. An extra attack, just like the other melee classes. So instead of one attack, we get two. For this build, it is really useful. You'll see that in a demonstration later on with uh, this. Now we're level up to, yes, the level 6 fighter. And we get ourselves a new feat because we're a fighter, folks. Just like every other, you know, fighter subclass. I decided to, uh, let's see here, I could do Sentinel, that's a good one. Which, of course, gives you a reaction when your allies get attacked and such. As long as they don't have the Sentinel feet. This one's better toughness, so you, your, max, your hit point maximum increased by 2 for every level you have gained. So, total 24 extra hit points. Now, add another 12 for the Gold Dwarf, and you're set. Now, uh, for level 7, yeah, we get ourselves some uh, new features. First of all, we get this. You have um, you have honed your body and magic for war. After you cast a level zero spell, you can make a weapon attack using a bonus action. So you cast, for example, the fire bolt, and then you go and just whack some foes with your normal blade or uh, so. We get two more spells. I side do darkness this way if we are having trouble with certain foes that we could blind them. 
We can stand outside a cloud and long enough to hit him from range. I say melee weapon range, of course, which is good. Another one is Gust of Wind. We can knock foes off balance if there's too many of them, which is a great option to use for one turn. Now we're at level 8. This is where we start putting our ability scores in. Now if you have Auntie Ethel's hair, then uh, use uh, other ones. But for now, let's go ahead and do Mirror Image. This is the most broken spell for the Eldritch Knight. You create three illusionary duplicates of yourself. Each duplicate increases your armor class by three. So if you have three duplicates, that's nine armor class. You have 21 AC, that's 30 AC. That's basically make you almost unhittable. So let's do ability improvement. So we're going to go ahead and put some points in strength. Everything in the strength so we just hit foes like a little bit, little by little. A lot of other builds will do dexterity. I prefer strength so this way I do some damage as I tank. Now we're at level 9 and let's see what we do get. Okay, we get indomitable. So if we mess up on a saving throw, we get to try again. Simple as that. Very useful definitely for this build. If you're tanking, you get hit with a fireball or something like that. Now we're at level 10. There's going to be a lot of things going on. Now, uh, first of all, we get this one here. Eldritch Strike. When you hit a creature with a weapon, it has a disadvantage on your next saving throws against a spell you uh, cast. So you do melee weapon, then you do a level 0 spell, and a good times roll. Now, uh, this one I decided to pick was a uh, made chance case. I used the Get the Yankee one up. Now, if you're non-Get the Yankee, yeah, great idea to pick that. I felt that was the best option. True Strike's not bad, but that's just one round. Melf's Acid, I would probably say, really Shatter is the best uh, spell to do. It pushes enemies back, gives them disadvantages on saving throws. So if there's too many near your allies, pop the spell near them, and hopefully they don't get hit. Instead, they uh, the folks get hit. Now we're at level 11, folks. So we only get, one, I think, one thing and gain a spell. Let's talk about the thing we get. We get extra, uh, improve extra attacks. So instead of two, we get four now with our main weapon. So in this case, it's our one-handed weapon. Really useful for a pure fighter, folks. And I decide to uh, go for Mel's, ma uh, I should say, Acid Arrows. This is a single damage target. We put Acid Damage on them, which is good. If they miss, I say if they are on miss, targets still take half the initial damage. Very good pulling spell as uh, well. More like I see. Now we're at you guys, at level 12, everyone. So this is what we get, a new feat. Last time, replace your spells. That's a warning. And as for feet, we're going to boost our strength to 20. So we're going to have definitely 20 strength at this point in the time. So there you go. We have that, and we're all uh, done for leveling up our uh, character. So that's about it for the Eldritch Knight. For the next part of this uh, build video, what we're going to do is talk about permanent ability score boosts. So here's the deal, everyone. There's permanent ability scores that you could definitely get boosted in the game. Act 1 has one. If you spare Auntie Ethel during her first encounter, you'll, uh, she'll uh, give you ability to uh, pick a score of your choice to boost it by 1. So it's, she has to be underneath 10 hit points to do so. Avoid having your Palatin to get the kill, otherwise they might be an Oathbreaker if they definitely took the bait, I call it. You can get it, however, for this uh, build. I do advise probably Strength definitely. If you uh, do do strength, then uh, go for one of the other defensive builds that has gives you plus one strength and another bonus with that. Now, Act 2, um, with the Steron, you got to keep him alive and in your party for this. Have him by Aja in the Moonrise Towers. Yeah, that's the Alchemy Vendor, the Drow one. Once you do that, she'll give you a plus two strength potion. Drink that, there goes your, there you gain plus two strength. I'll demonstrate that in the video. Last but not least is the Mirror Loss. Uh, you get three outcomes out of it, but you have to pass some intelligent checks. So definitely make sure you have from one of the, uh, or, or, I think, Ogres from Act 1, 17 plus intelligent helmet. This way you'll bypass, uh, you'll attempt to uh, pass a good, at least for the intelligent checks. Always save scum on that. So one outcome is if you pass a hidden, uh, I think, charisma check, you get a plus one charisma as a bonus. And you talk to the mirror again, pass another check, you get a plus two stat of your choice. Now, if you don't pass the initial charisma check, you only get the plus two stat your choice. Or uh, nothing, you don't pass anything. You still lose something, but you get to uh, cure yourself. I'll explain about that a bit further when we do a demonstration of it. First demonstration is the plus two strength potion. I did mention you need a steron with you, so uh, this way you can vent some through a check. 
if you do it right, then a sterile will bite this uh, female drow. Once that happens, then she'll give you a plus two strength potion that permanently increases your plus two strength. See, there you go. The strength has been increased by two. I was demonstrating on my Paladin at the time during the Paladin playthrough, and it's very great for the melee characters, even the tanks as well. Here is the deal about the mirror loss, everyone. So let me go ahead and explain that at this uh, time. The mirror loss, when you use it after you get past the checks, first you lose something. Uh, number one is usually uh, strength uh, on the minus, two dexterity minus, three constitution, four intelligence on the minus, five wisdom, and six charisma. And don't worry, it's curable. Remove curse will uh, do it. So if you get a rightful check, then you get the following. Number one gives you plus two strength. Number two gives you plus two dexterity. Number three gives you plus two constitution. Number four is plus two intelligence. Number five is plus two wisdom. And number six is plus two charisma. For uh, this build, go for number one. This gives you plus two strength. I'm just demonstrating right now is what happens if you uh, do... Uh, Take any one of these six right there. And no, don't be deceptive when you're going for the loss. You get nothing out of it. Nada. Char knows what's up. So we're just going to go ahead and go through the emotions of that. And uh, there you go. And as you see before you, we just uh, gain plus two in a stat of our uh, choice. Go for strength, definitely. Now, if you get lucky on the plus one charisma, that is fine. You just roll the 20 on that. So that's about it for a demonstration of the mirror loss. I'm going to go ahead and show the final results of the stats if you do get some uh, permanent stat boosts. So with the permanent stat boosts, this is uh, before. So when you're done, of course, leveling up, I should say, 1 through 12, you get 20 strength, 14 dexterity, 16 constitution, 10 intelligence, 10 wisdom, and 8 charisma. Now, after uh, you, you take the potion and the mirror loss and, of course, Auntie Ethel's hair, if you decide to go that path, 24 strength. Now, uh, you get that, Dexterity 14, Constitution 16. Unless you uh, decide not to uh, pick the Strength for the Hair, then it'll be up to 17. Intelligence 10, Wisdom 10, and Charisma 8. So if you decide to uh, definitely use this build for this playthrough, those are what you get before and after. Next part of this build video is Tadpole Powers. This is a very good time to go ahead and go over the Tadpole Powers. I split up into two sections. The first section is before you decide to use the Astral Tadpole. You can also stop there as well with the Tadpole powers there. And then after you consume the Astral Tadpole, which will give you new access to more power. So let's go over before and after. Favorable beginnings. Boosts attack rolls or gives you advantage in dialogues. So here's the deal. For combat, it's really nice. Gives you a little bit of extra damage. Call the weak when a creature has few, I should say, hit points less than your tadpole powers, it dies. So it's a good, very good passive power. So, for example, if the creature only has, say, three hit points left and you have five tadpole powers, it dies instantly. Yep, game over for him. Psionic Backlash. When a foe casts a spell, you do 1d4 damage per caster level. This is very powerful against those annoying spell casters. Yeah, use this and boom. Sometimes they die, sometimes they reel very, very badly. Force Tunnel, charge forward and draws no attack of opportunity when you do this. This is a perfect uh, charge, so if you decide to use a bonus action, what would happen is you'll do a nice charge, and then after that, you'll be able to move closer. Uh, another one I did like recently is Drain Ability, and attack can draw either Strength, which is melee, or Dex, which is range. And also for this build I didn't list, I'm going to go ahead and say, if you decide you use magic, that's intelligence base. It'll also uh, they'll get drained in that as well. Very good ability to start out in combat against certain foes. So if you decide to go melee first, they lose some strength. And if you decide to go dex, they lose some dex. Or if you decide to pull with magic, they definitely use, lose intelligence. So let's go ahead and get to the tadpole powers when you do consume the astral touch tadpole. Black hole. This is a OP AOE attack. It can annihilate some foes in one shot. This is a very powerful attack you definitely want to use. And believe me, towards end game, I abuse this like crazy. Another one is fly. This will gain ability to fly. This is great for flying around the battlefield. So this way, you go back and uh, forth with that. Repulsor AOE pushback attack that does damage. So if there's way too many foes surrounding you, 
or bury at your allies, go ahead and use this to push them back. Last but not least is free cast. Next ability, spells, or anything else is free of charge to use. So you want to use mirror image, pop this sucker first, and then not cast mirror image next. That's about it for tadpole powers. Next up is gear of ice. In this part of the build, we're going to go over gear. You uh, guessed it. I split it into two categories. Number one, you should get by the end of Act 1 and end game gear. Please note, if it's marked by Act number, make sure you do not leave said Act until you get the said gear. I list it. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the, you should get by the end of Act 1. Let's uh, go ahead and talk about the headpieces first. Grim Skull Helm. Attacker ca cannot land critical hits on you. Gains fire resistance, gain use of Hunter's Mark. In other words, you do more damage against them. This is a very good helmet. Grim drops this at the Amantite Forge in the Underdark Part 2 in Act 1. Now, if you're afraid to definitely uh, go ahead and get this, then the next one is the Haste Helm. Gains momentum for three rounds. It is in a locked chest in the Blight Village in Act 1. Gives more ability to move around the battlefield, which is nice. Holy Lance Helm, Smite the Great List. Now, this does this foes who miss their attacks on you must make a deck save or takes 1 to 4 radiant damage. Plus 1 constitution saves as well. This is a good tanking helmet. It's a nice alternative. You use it. This is in Act 1 at the Mountain Pass. On to the next set of gear. Next up is the Amantite Sprint Mail. Reduces all damage by 2. When foes hit you, they get a minus 1 for, on, on their attacks for 3 rounds. Cannot be hit by critical hits. This is in the Amantite Type Forge, Iron Dark, and Act 1. You have to craft this. Very important. You want to be able to craft two items. So this is one of the ones you want to choose wisely for this build. Next up, there's alternatives in case you don't want to go that route. Chainmail plus one or full plate. Many places in Act 1. I say go for a Chainmail plus one. That's the best way to do it. Next up are the gloves. Gloves of the Growling Underdog. Two or more foes that, you, that surround you, uh, you gain advantage on melee attacks. Which is good. This will also give you plus one strength saving throws. Door Razglin, treasure crates. You have to get the key from uh, Doors Razglin himself in the Shower Sanctuary in Act 1 in order to get this. Another alternative, I felt like this is good this time. Usually I use uh, the gloves for my main character for DPS, but this is good for tanking as well. Gloves of Dexterity. Dex is set to 18, which by the way increases your, you guessed it, armor class. Also gives you plus one attack. Get the Yankee Crash. Now, this vendor does sell it to you in Act 1, so you play it cool, buy everything from her if you can before going ahead and attacking her later on. So, let's go ahead to the next set of gear you want to get by the end of Act 1. The Boots of Speed. When used, your momentum is double for one round. So, in other words, you move around a lot quicker. Great for tanks. Thurla, the Deep Gnome, has this item in Act 1. You have to help her out in the Myochondria Village, or Myochondria Call it, need a uh, call it, or you could convince her to give you the boots. Here's some alternatives, everyone, for the boots. Boots of Genile Striding. The wearer's movement speed is unimpeded by difficult terrain. Very good item if you're tanking. Blurk sells this in the Underdark Act 1. Same place where you get the boots of speed. No cloak, sorry for uh, that in Act 1. Necklace, amulet of branding. Foes get hit with branding spell, takes double damage. In melee combat, get the Yankee Crash. Now the vendor who uh, actually sells the gloves of dexterity will drop this as well. Now there's an alternative one. This one's really good for tanks. Amulet of restoration. Use uh, if you, there's uh, two uh, spells on it. Mass healing word and healing word. So you can heal others if you need to. Dryzer's Bone Cloak sells this at the Myochondria Colony on Dark Act 1. Yeah, that place has a lot of good items, so have plenty of gold for it. Let's move on to the next set of items. Now, rings, I did this a bit different than my melee builds on one of them. Crusher Ban, movement speed is plus 3. Steal or loot this from Crusher to uh, get this in the Goblin Camp in Act 1. Next up is the Ring of Protection, AC plus one, and saving throws. Complete small quest to steal the Sylvanas uh, Idol in the Druid's Grove. You have to uh, go ahead and complete that before actually completing the Druid Crest is where you save it. Otherwise, Mole will not give you the quest. That one's a bit more risky. Now, if you don't want to get the Ring of Protection, I got some good alternatives. Caustic Band, you deal plus two acid damage to foes. Dardrith's Pwn Cloak sells this at Mitochondria Colony under Dark in Act 1. Very popular place, everyone. Remember that. Ring of Absolute Force. Use of Thunderwave spell if Absolute Branding 
is on you. You deal one extra damage. Sergeant Thurman in the Grim Forge in Act One, Underdark will actually sell you this, or you have to give him to. You have to kill him for it, most likely. Spark Wall cannot be electrocuted. Electric resistance increases. Arcane Tower Basement Underdark Part One in Act One. That's about it for rings. So let's get to the next set of items. Now this next weapon, I'm going to go ahead and say is one of the best tanking weapons in the game. It's also a very good cleric weapon as well. But if you have a tank in this party and your main character is a tank, go ahead and take it over to the cleric. There's another good weapon for them as well to get that in the future. The Blood of Lathandar. Now it's a plus three mace. Lathandar's light, this will happen, sheds holy light in a six meter radius. Now in combat, fiends and undead standing in the light are blinded unless they do a successful constitution saving throw. Lathandar's Blessing. Once per long rest, when your hit points is zero, you heal 2d12. Allies near you, which is about 6 meters, heals 1d6. Also, you get the Sunbeam Spell, which is once per long rest. It's the same thing as the level 6 version of that, which does a lot of damage against the undead. Here's how to get it. Solve the Mountain Puzzle in Act 1. That's before they get the Yankee Crash. When you put, I believe, three of the four weapons there, because one was already there. Then you get a key for it. Once you get the key, go ahead and get the Yankee Crash, explore it. Until you open up the artifact. Once you're done opening up the artifact, there's a little sideways to uh, go. You evade all the traps. Once you do that, use the key and you get the mace. Very best weapon in the game. This is all done in Act 1. Here's some alternatives if you cannot get this in Act 1 you're not there yet. A Mantite Longsword. If you don't want to give the mace to yourself, this is a nice alternative. This is a plus one longsword. Diamond's Bane, if a Manti weapon hits an object, the hit is always critical. So you break it down the door, you're going to do some high damage. Lethal Weapon ignores resistance to slashing damage. This is created at the Manti Forge in Underdark Act 1. Just remember you have two, I should say, Mithril ores you to uh, create items with. Good idea to do one of them if you're going to do a tank in this uh, playthrough. Now, uh, next one is the Defender Flail, plus one flail. Steel Physiology reduces incoming blunt, piercing, and slashing damage. AC plus one, main hand only, tenacity. When you miss attack, you deal one blunt damage anyways. This is the same NPC that does sell the gloves dexterity by before attacking at the Get the Yankee Crush in Act 1. That frail is a great tanking weapon because plus one AC on McCoy. That's a free AC point there. So next up are the shields you want to get before you do end Act 1. Now, let's go ahead and talk about our offhand weapon, the shield. So, here's the first shield you definitely want to get. Glowing shield, AC plus 2. When you're 50% or less hit points, you gain 8 temporary hit points. This is the northeast part of the goblin camp. You go beyond that. There's an area full of traps. You evade it, and then you get the shield that way. Now, if you don't want to get that shield, you decide to give it the shadow heart, for instance. Wood ward shield, that's AC plus 2. When you use wards in staring strike, your foe cannot move. Foe takes 1d6 damage. Attacking foe, this will give you advantage in combat against them. Foe has attacking and dex, uh, I should say, saving throw disadvantage Why in this effect. This drops from the wood wards in the Fetid Bog in Act 1. Very good alternative shield. Now this one I definitely toss in case uh, you have some money at the very start of the game. Safeguard shield, AC plus 2, saving throws plus 1. Damien sells this in Act 1 at the Druid's Grove. Good idea to visit Damien for anything else as well. And last but not least, range weapons you want to get for Act 1. Now, this one's slightly different. You uh, guessed it than my, I should say, DPS build. Spell Thief, normal longbow, unfortunately. Now, here's the great thing about this. Now, this uh, ability, Arcane Vehemence. Once per short rest, you gain a, I should say, you regain a uh, level 1 spell slot when you land a critical hit with the Spell Thief. So if you do put a photo to sleep, you automatically get a critical hit and you get a free level 1 spell slot. Very useful for this build, by the way, folks. So if you decide to use all your level 1 spell slots, you need more. Go ahead and use a ranged weapon. If you do a critical hit, there you go. You have another uh, shot at using shield. Aron sells this at the Druid Grove in Act 1. That is the Halfling Merchant there. You get this early on. Buy it ASAP. Now here's some good alternatives. In case you decide to give the bow to someone else. Titan String Bow, this is a plus one longbow. This longbow does damage equal to your strength mod. So in other words, uh, if your strength mod is uh, two, you get a nice bonus damage to uh, that. Bring in the Zents Hideout sells this in Act 1 after helping out the Zents in the Missing Shipment quest. Another one, this is a good one. Giant Breaker, plus one heavy crossbow. 
Folks get a minus one attack for two rounds when hit. Bream in the Zent hideout sells his act one. Same thing as the other boat. You got to complete the missing shipping quest. That is about it for all the gear you want to get at the by the end of Act One. So in other words, do not leave Act One and enter the Shadow Curse lands before doing this. Now next up is the end game gear. I'm gonna go ahead and repeat this if I have not yet. So here's the deal. These items that are found in Act 2 and Act 3, make sure you do not leave said act until you actually get them. So let's go over the helmets, okay, headgear. Helm of Baronian heals two hit points per round, plus one armor class, and saving throws cannot be stunned, cannot be critical hit against. Defeat the one way trials and the boss in it in Act 3 in order to get this. Now here's some alternatives in case someone's wearing that helmet. The Helldusk Helmet. Can see through normal and magical darknesses. Cannot be blinded. Plus two saving throws against spells. Where is immune to critical hits? This is at the House of Hope in our lock room in Act 3. You got to pass some saving throws. If not, no access to it. This helmet is actually really good because I love the saving throws with the spells. And of course, you cannot be blinded. That's a bonus. Last but not least is Saravox Horn Helmet. Gain or increase vision meters with dark vision if you have it or not. Number of critical hits dropped by one. Cannot be frightened. Constitution save plus one. You know who drops this at the Mirror Tribunal. So uh, here's the deal. This one's good because I love that you cannot be frightened at all. If you're a tank, you be frightened. You're kind of useless. But still, it's a good helmet to use. Let's get to the next one. The Cloak of Protection. This is the main cloak you should definitely use. This is different than my other DPS builds. This gives you AC plus one and saving throws plus one. Cora Masatali at the last light in an act two sells this. Buy it before you leave. In fact, when you arrive, you have enough gold from a Steron stealing. Get it ASAP. That plus one AC helps out greatly, especially he has so high AC layer on, you're basically almost unhittable. Now, here's some good alts. Flesh Meller Cloak. When where it gets hit, the attacker take one through four acid damage. Gilded Chest in the House of Healing Morgan Act 2. Another Act 2 item. Get that ASAP. Do not leave the act without it. And for some reason, someone else using the two cloaks above, or you didn't get either of them. The third choice is a Cinder Moth Cloak. Attacker takes burning damage, which is one to four, five damage per round. Elias Cyrus in the Lower Sea Sewers has this. You have to force him into combat. He drops it in Act 3. Let's go to the next set of items. The first thing I'm going to talk about, chest pieces. Helldusk Armor. Can use heavy armor when you wear this, so if you're not even proficient in it, you can use it. When a caster spell hits you and you make a save, caster takes burning damage. You're immune also to burning damage. You're very resistant to fire damage. And also uh, it takes three less damage from all sources. Raphael drops this in Act 3. This is the ultimate tank and DPS armor, depending on who you, uses it. In this case, you should use it. Here's some, some good alternatives if you do not want to defeat Raphael at all. Armor of Resistance, damage reduction by 2, gain resistance, and Blade Ward. Resistance up to resistance, Blade Ward cuts your slashing, piercing, and blunt damage. Same thing as the uh, level 0 spell you have. Damien sells this in Act 3 in the lower city only. Buy it ASAP. It's a lot of money, but have a stare on steel like crazy gold, and then get the item. Here's some good, uh, here's some gloves. Now, this is a nice alternative one. If you're still using the, uh, the one from Act 1, that's a good one, but here we go. Gauntlet of Hill Giant Strength, plus one saving throws. Your strength set to 23. Archives at the House of Hope in Act 3. Okay, here's the deal. If your strength is uh, naturally 24, the plus 23 strength is useless, but if not, great to have. Now, for some reason, uh, I should say definitely if your strength is 24 or someone else is using that. Another alternative is Legacy of the Masters, plus two attack and damage rolls. With weapons, plus two strength saves. Damon also sells this in the lower scene in Act uh, 3 as well. Now, I'm going to give advice about this. If you still kept the Gloves of Dexterity from Act 1, this helps you out because it boosts up your armor class. In fact, no one else is using it. Go ahead and put those on. That's all I'm going to go ahead and say. Let's go ahead and roll over to the next set of items. The boots, I went big time different on. So let me go ahead and explain. Evasive shoes, AC plus one, and acrobats plus one. In other words, you easily move around in combat and such. Mathis sells this only in Act 3. So you get the little tiefling kid to Act 3, you get these boots. Wear ASAP because you have high AC with this build. 
you're basically unhittable. You just got to worry about magic and definitely the environment. Well, if you have some spell resistance, you only have to worry about environmental damage. Here's some uh, decent alternatives. Helldux boost cannot be moved by magical or normal means. So in other words, you're basically immune to that. You move to difficult to terrain, so in other words, you move around if there's like something like slippery or swampy or something like that. When you fail a saving throw, you can use your reaction to succeed instead. Uh, another great thing, and then when you teleport to the area, you do 2D, I should say, 2 to 16 damage in the area. This is in Lord Gortash's room in Act 3. He has the key, so you have to most likely kill him for it. These boots are very good because I love it because of difficulty terrain. You move around, you cannot be moved at all since you're a tank. Yeah, you're a wall at that point. And if, even if you fail your saving throws, that's a good item. Now, next up is necklaces. I went a bit different on this one. Uh, so I only uh, put two. I felt like that's the best. Amulet of the Harpers gives you an advantage on wisdom save throws, allow you to cast shield spell once per short rest. This shield spell, what it does is it it's just like the uh, level one spell you have. It's great to use. Now, Core Master Tally at the last light in an Act 2 Celsius. In fact, when you arrive in Act 2 at the last light and you have enough gold from Mysteron stealing or so, go ahead and buy it, along with the Cloak of Protection. Here's some good alternatives. Amulet of the Greater Health. Constitution set to 23. Advantage on Constitution saving throws. In the Archives at the House of Hope in Act 3. So here's the deal. This amulet is a great alternative. You're not going to get the shield spell, but you can get a whole bunch of hit points. And if you're a gold dwarf, you're going to get a really lot of hit points. Sorry I'm excited, but I'm just telling you how it is. Let's move on over to the next set of items you definitely want for endgame. We're going to go ahead and talk about the rings. Not the rings that you see in common books. Not that certain one ring. And I did eliminate it down to a few. Uh, no, we're not going to get Killer Sweetheart. I advise giving that to a DPS person or someone like a Steron. Ring of Regeneration at the start of combat, you regenerate 1 through 4 hit points. Roland sells this in Act 3 at the Sorcerer's Sundries. If you see him first time, buy it ASAP, everyone. This is a very good ring because when you start combat, you regenerate health like crazy every round. And you take a little bit of damage by magical effects or environment. Great to use. Ring of free action, you ignore the effects of difficult terrain and cannot be paralyzed or restrained. Aja, that's the strength potion NPC, sells this in Act 2 at the Moonrise Towers. Buy this ASAP, I mean, come on. You can't be, uh, go, you can't be hurt by difficult terrain, and plus, you can't be paralyzed or restrained. That's a great thing for a tank. Now, all I'm going to say is if you still have that Ring of Protection from Act 1, keep it because AC plus 1 is good. Now, there's uh, two rings that are lover embraces that the... At the Shout Curse Lands in Act 2, this is honorable mention. So uh, what, what it does is uh, if uh, you and someone else has it, that person or you could cast some kind of warding protecting spell on it if you want to go that route. That's just honorable mention. Let's uh, move on over to the next set of items. Okay, this one I'm going to be blunt and honest. If you did get this mace like you did in Act 1, this is the best tanking weapon. Yeah, you guessed it, the Blood of Lathandar. You already know what it is, so I would definitely say use it. For some reason, if a cleric or someone else is using that, here's an alternative you could get in Act 3. Raven Guard Scourge. This is a Morningstar Plus 2, Commander Strike. Direct an ally to strike a foe. The ally uses a reaction on their next turn to make a weapon attack. This is a main hand weapon only. Tenacity. When you miss an attack, you deal one blunt damage. And that is in the County House Vault in the Lower City in Act 3. It's at Duke Ravengard's Vault. You have to have his key, which is hard to get, or better yet, you have his stare on your party. Lockpick the sucker. So here's the deal about this uh, weapon. This weapon I really like because the commander strikes. So if you're going to the thick of battle, like for example, you and Lizelle. And then uh, you use this Commander Strike, which is probably once per short rest or long rest. I guess a tough boss. And uh, what you uh, do next is uh, Command Lizelle to attack the same target as you. Then it's Lizelle's turn. She attacks the target with that reaction. Then she uses her normal attacks at this point, level 12, which is 4. And if she uses Surge, that's a lot more attacks. And that's most likely 9 out of 10 times. You just uh, had Lizelle kill someone for you. So that's about it for, uh, I should say, main-handed weapons. Let's go ahead and talk about shields. Vontia's Walking Fortress. 
So here's the deal on this. This gives you AC plus three, rebuke of the might. When foes hit you with a melee attack, you can use reaction, make your foe take a dex saving throw. Failure to do so on the foe's part, they're prone status. Success, your foe is not prone status. Reaction also makes foe, no matter what, take two to eight force damage. You also have saving throws on spells, and foe's spells attack on you has disadvantages. Reflective shell, foe's projection will be thrown back at them. So that's like uh, throwing it back where, where it comes from. Warding bond allies you uh, pick to have this gains plus one AC, saving throws plus one, and both take the same damage. So this is like a feedback damage if you want to protect someone. You know who drops this in the House of Grief in Act 3. Now here's an alternative shoe you want to get. This is from Act 2. For some reason, you didn't want to kill you-know-who, or you gave that shield to Shao Heart. Here's a good alternative. Shield of Devotion. This is AC plus 2. One additional level 1 spell slots, which is good. Shield Bash. After you make a melee attack, you can make a reaction and attempt to put the foe attacking you into a prone status. Dex saves they make, they will not be prone. They'll otherwise, they'll be prone for one round. 8. Heals you and your allies. Increase their hit points temporarily by 5. Core Master Tally and the Last Light Inn in Act 2 also sells this. Yeah, you definitely want to buy this at the Last Light Inn. Have plenty of gold when you're first there, definitely. Now I'm going to go ahead and talk about this shield a bit more. What I like about it most with this build is additional level 1 uh, spell slots. When you use shield, it is really useful. And when it's a reaction, that gives you another chance to, you know, raise your shield. So that's a very good uh, alternative shield. Let's go ahead and talk about ranged weapons. For range weapons, about the same I did with my melee DPS build. So I'm going to go ahead and go over uh, two of them. Dark Fire Short Bow, plus two Short Bow, gains resistance to fire and ice, can cast haste. Damien sells this in Act 2. If you're lucky, he also sells this in Act 3 as well. It's just one of those in the game. I like it because it gains resistance in ice. Uh, it's another resistance in fire is good. And also, haste is a very nice spell to use on your character when you're tanking. Now, another alternative, I felt like this is a nice one. It's the same one I did with my tanks. No, well, my DPS, not tanks. Fabricate Abolis, plus two heavy crossbow, illuminate shot, fire shimmering bolt that inflicts one of uh, radiant orbs upon the target that deals 1d4 piercing damage. Dazzling uh, Ray, unleash a beam of brilliant light, blinds all creatures in the path until spell ends. That damage is uh, 2d10, and if they make a safe throw, that's half of that. And of course, you can cast it over and over again. Bad news is you might get blind by it. Now, Lord Gortash drops this in Act 3. Now, if there's any other uh, bows, I'll probably suggest one more honorable mention. Spell Thief. Uh, it's the uh, non-magical bow, but however, like I said before previously, I love stealing that level 1 spell slot from someone else so I could use it for shield. That's about it for equipment. Next up on this build video, as you guessed it, potions! Now, next up are the consumables, where we we'll go over first the potions, then the elixirs, and then finally the oils. So, let's talk about the potions. As always, when you want to get potions, healing potions, get them all, especially if you're a tank. Things look like tough, like, so for example, spells are, like, bad against you. Things not going away on the spellcasters hitting you. Yeah, drink a healing potion. Potion of Haste gains extra action, plus two armor class, advantage on dexterity saving throws, and double speed movement. This potion is very abused a lot in the game, especially if you're a tank, because, I mean, come on. You get that extra movement around, and then you get that extra armor class? Good. Potion of Flying, same as the fly spell. You can fly around if you need to get somewhere in order to mess with the foes. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the elixirs. Honorable mention, Bark Skin Potion. That will boost your AC up to 16. Very useless once you get over, I should say, 16 AC. But still, start at the very beginning of the game to always drink those as a tank. Until you get that point. Here we go, Elixir of Vig Vigilance. Gains plus 5 bonus on initiative and cannot be surprised. Since we do not have the alert feat with this build, you definitely want to drink this. That's your number one priority is that potion. Elixir of Colossus increased size, gains strength saves and advantages. Plus, uh, does 1d4 weapon damage, and you can jump around since your size is really big. Good potion to get around with. Uh, next one is Elixir of the Viciousness. Increase your chance of landing a critical hit. So, you want to tank do a little bit more damage, that's a way to go. Another good one is the Elixir of Cloud Giant Strength. Set your strength to 27. 
Good strength boosting potion. If you get the hill giant variant, it sets it to 23. Last but not least, I like this one recently. It's good for a tank as well. Elixir of Bloodlust. Upon killing a foe, you gain five temporary hit points and an extra bonus action. As a tank, that is really good. Let's get to the next one. Even as a tank, you want to coat your weapon. Now, oil accuracy, this is a coat weapon, bonus of plus two in attack rolls, very good to use. Wizard Bane Oil, its target receives a ne negative three penalty to spell attack rolls and spell save DC and disadvantage on saving throws for maintaining concentration for two rounds. Great oil for a tank. You oil up your Wizard Bane Oil on the weapon and then find a caster and go ham on them. Any poisons is uh, good as uh, well. So next part of this video is combat demonstration. The ideal here is to uh, for this build is to make sure you're the person that's staying perfectly still until a certain point, and then you go ahead and move and attack foes. So, for example, we're going to set up Lizel here to move to a certain spot, which is this spot. Attack this foe, attempt to take out this foe with one hit. No, nope, we'll try again. Now we'll just move over this direction. So this way, this archer attempts to move. Archer dies. Simple as uh, that. Our reactions will help out definitely... If we weaken any foes, the rest of our party members will definitely finish them off. So basically, yeah, you're going to start learning about tanking. Of course, using a sword, I should say a sword, mace, right, or axe, or definitely with a shield. Yeah, one of the th uh, three combination type of one-handed weapons. Let's go ahead and talk about if things so somewhat start to go south. I am demonstrating in Act 2 what happens if things are starting to go very badly as a tank. Well, sometimes when things go bad, you just improvise and tank like crazy. And you can do is just use your racial abilities, your jumping, get yourself all set up so this way your party members don't die at all. And another thing is, is as always, if things also in trouble, have your uh, DPS that has heavily played it to help you out big time taking out foes while you're tanking. So just keep you cool and you uh, definitely got this. Here's some final advice before I do end the video. So when you do start out, learn about pulling with certain spells. Also learn to abuse the reaction with the shield spell, which helps you out greatly. Boost up your AC as much as possible because more AC you have, more likely you're not going to be hittable. Mirror image is very abusive in this uh, game. If you do it right, you can start out with 9 free AC. And if you have, for example, 21, 22 AC, that's about 30, 31 and you have that AC that is really high. Just remember mirror image when you do get hit or they try to hit you, you lose one image. And then as a whole, for a whole bunch of foes, try to get their attention. You could try to soften them up big time or take them out. If you can't take them out, your party members will definitely take them out big time. As for bosses, you go in first. Make sure the boss is fixated on you. Once that happens, send in everybody else to either take out the yard trash or the boss itself. Know your tactics, keep you cool, abuse the uh, potions, oils, and elixirs, and set up yourself to get some very good gear. This is it for my Baldur's Gate 3 Purifier Eldritch Knight, the Protector Build video. This is Lorefent signing off. Thanks for watching, and have a great day or night. Do please stay safe. Please subscribe to my channel for more classic and modern Dungeons and Dragons walkthroughs, builds, guides, and more just like this. If you like what you see, then uh, go ahead and pick my suggestion on the upper left-hand corner or YouTube suggestion on the bottom left-hand corner. I'm going to go ahead and relax in this nice chair.